Hi and welcome to Terry Talks Movies. This time around I've got a really interesting film for you. A movie shot in 1968, an American mainstream film about a pandemic in New York. So let's get going. The movie's called What's So Bad About Feeling Good and it's a comedy which is really odd in so many ways and I've seen it twice now over a couple of month period and there's so many missed opportunities in this film and so many missteps but still it's interesting because of what we've all lived through since 2019. Now before we get started I don't want anti-vaxxers and nutcases pounding my comments telling me about vaccines and stuff like that because I'm going to block you if you do. I don't need disinformation on my channel but having said that it's a bit of fun. Basically, the story is this. A toucan from South America is carried aboard a Greek freighter into New York City, and the toucan is infected with a virus which transmits itself across species to the human race. And the only effect of this virus is that people feel good about themselves. It's an antidepressant virus, which is a concept that is really deeply interesting and could be applied in a whole bunch of different ways. It would make good and interesting science fiction but instead this one plays it lightly it's actually based on a novel which i haven't read now as far as the stars are concerned george Pepard playing pete a guy who's a kind of beatnik now this is 1968 so beatniks were about 10 years old this time and the director george seaton and his co-writer get beatniks and hippies confused which is really weird because they're two separate subcultures. The Beatniks started within 10 years of the end of World War II and were a reaction against American middle 20th century nuclear family concepts. There were a lot of queer people involved in the Beatnik movement. There were poets and, and writers and other people and some people with undiagnosed mental illnesses like Neil Cassidy. And they were a very different group than the idealistic young people that came out of the hippie movement in Haight-Ashbury and Greenwich Village in the 1960s. The ideological optimism and the idealism of the hippies is very much at odds with the beatniks. And this movie gets them mixed up. So Pete, played by George Papad, a beatnik, he's dropped out of a Madison Avenue executive position, think Mad Men, and he's living with his girlfriend Liz, played by Mary Tyler Moore, who's probably one of the most white bred women to ever play a beatnik she's lounging around in capri pants and a sweatshirt but her eye makeup is perfect because this kind of mid 20th century studio film the main woman's eye makeup is always perfect and so they're living in a, a place with a whole bunch of other people there's a beatnik woman who lives in a sack and doesn't wash and nobody thinks this is a thing that they need to address because she's obviously got some mental health issues no it's just an eccentricity so Pete and Liz are living in this loft in New York, which would now go for about five million. And they uh, encounter the toucan who transmits the virus first to Pete and then to Liz. And Pete immediately does some weird things. He cuts his hair, cuts his beard and starts wearing a suit. I know a lot of people and I don't know many of them that are more comfortable in a suit than in a sweatshirt. I think suits are corporate cosplay. And this movie doesn't seem to know that. It doesn't seem to recognise the fact that for people being comfortable in their clothing is not wearing a suit and tie. And Liz does the same thing. She kind of gets her hair done, becomes very middle class and ordinary. And then this virus starts spreading across New York City, which is shown at the start of the film to be basically a rat's nest of screaming unhappy people. We see scenes of urban decay, of noise pollution, of pollution itself of screaming cab drivers yelling at each other all of this kind of stuff so new york is is not portrayed well at the start of this film it's seen as a shithole and to be honest with you in the 60s and 70s you can make that argument quite successfully as this virus spreads and pete and liz actively spread it in a number of ways some of which are amusing some of which aren't it becomes a national crisis because it's affecting the economy people aren't drinking people aren't smoking People are getting married more. People are quitting jobs they don't like and living their best lives. The movie's idea of a person's best life is pretty 
piss poor and ordinary. That's what it does, and it becomes a national crisis. The mayor of New York, played by John McMartin, who was a really fine stage actor, ends up being in a fallout shelter bunker beneath the Pan Am building to protect him and his people from this happiness virus. Commissioner of Health recommends that you wear a surgical mask when you are out in public. Now, you may use any kind you wish, or you may obtain this type at your nearest fire or police station. The President of the United States, who at this stage would have been probably, was it Nixon? Um, or Johnson, one of the two. Sends a troubleshooter, a guy called Jay Gardner Munro, played by Dom DeLuise, as a very camp character. And what about the Asian flu? That came straight, believe you me, from Red China. So it becomes a crisis, and they're looking for ways to deal with this. They're trying to catch the toucan so it can't spread the disease further. There's a whole bunch of talk about the epidemic and how people need to wear masks to stop transmission of the virus. Well, I've got it. So have I. You've got, you've got what? It's the virus. The virus. And it's the greatest thing. And you see scenes of people in New York City wearing masks. This is before 2019, 2020. And it gives us a strange but powerful connection to this movie. And a lot of the same arguments are there. People don't want to wear masks. People don't believe the virus is real. People do all of the things that people did in 2019, 2021 to make things worse. And the government itself, in this case, makes things worse by getting this Jay Gardner Munro guy to try to stop the virus. They're really worried because they think it's a Russian plot and they think that America would be weakened if people were happy. Which, there's a deep satirical vein there which doesn't get mined very deeply in this film. When there are some satires about Madison Avenue which are very facile and about the fact that Madison Avenue sells pharmaceuticals that don't actually do what they say they do. There's a plan to isolate New York if the amount of infected people goes above 3 million, which is kind of silly because people are flying in and out of New York already, so the virus will be spreading. They, they don't have a lot of knowledge of how viruses spread. Now, one of, the, one of the sadder parts of it is the fact that the antivirus that they finally come up with is tested on Pete and Liz when they're called by the cops. And they put them in a hotel room with surveillance cameras and there's a lot of kind of lightly touched on satire of the surveillance state and of people affected by government surveillance. This movie doesn't punch anywhere near as hard as it would were it to be a movie that has a bit of guts to it. Even comedies at the time, 1968, the producers, Mel Brooks was making the producers in New York roughly at the same time. And that one punched hard and got a lot of criticism for being gross and things like that. What's so bad about feeling good really could have been better than it was. It really had the bones of a good, strong satire. So the antivirus is created and they find out that they can spread it through petrochemicals, through aeroplane, av aviation, gas and through diesel. So basically they weaponize pollution to make people unhappy. So this movie for me, I liked seeing it, I liked the parallels between then and now. And I kind of saw the potential for it, and I'm getting a little bit of that with a lot of the films I'm watching, particularly from the mid-1960s, where you can see such potential for having a really solid comedy movie, satirical and totally nailing the subject matter, but then flubbing it. It's a weird thing, and some of it, of course, is because of the innate conservatism of certain American studios, and the people running them were born in the first part of the 20th century. Like George Seaton, his co-writer Robert Pirosh, they're kind of stuck in the worldview of a previous generation. And that's something we all kind of do to a certain extent. I'm disappointed with this film more than I should be. I think the idea of a virus that causes happiness is a really interesting one to explore and to explore the ramifications of, and to a certain extent the movie does that. But it doesn't do it anywhere to the degree that would satisfy me. I would really love to see perhaps a remake done, maybe even semi-seriously, of this film and for it to talk about some of our contemporary issues through the lens of this virus. So yeah, I think you should see the movie. Kino Lorber have put it out on Blu-ray. 
and like a lot of the smaller and nimbler releasing companies they find these hidden gems and i think to a certain extent this is a hidden gem but it's a hidden gem that hasn't been polished i, I like george papard in the movie and mary kyler moore both of them were under contract to the studio at the time and so they did whatever the studio gave them but they're not really trying they're not showing the, their best selves i mean there are a whole bunch of movies in the 60s that papa did that were much more interesting movies like pendulum and pj and, uh, and a few others which are probably going to be coming out really soon in a box set here in australia and i may well get a copy of that to review and i'm looking forward to the potential of getting that george Peppard box set when it comes out are uh, those parallels between 2019 and 1968 and, and this quirky little mostly forgotten film are really interesting and seeing the alternate universe of a new york city with a pandemic in the 1960s makes it a little more interesting than it would be otherwise thanks a lot for watching if you enjoyed the video please like subscribe leave a comment thank you to the patreon supporters who support the channel through patreon.com slash terry dogs movies and to the channel members on youtube next up i've got science fiction saturday and i've got a double feature for you there and on monday we're doing the letters uh, q r and s for an extra long version of my movie hidden gems alphabetical listings so until then watch some good movies watch some bad movies watch some movies with two cans in them and i'll catch you next time Thank you.